It certainly is my honor to be your master of ceremonies today here in Reykjavik. It is incredible in these turbulent times that we have been able to do this, to get together nearly a thousand women leaders from around the world coming together, inspiring each other despite everything that's going on. Uh, just some practical notes, you can follow the proceedings on the Reykjavik Global Forum social media channels, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, the event is also streamed live, uh, live on CBS News. And uh, if you need guidance on how to navigate on Hopin, you check out the, um, the user guide on that platform. And there is a little chat bubble in your right hand bottom corner that you can click on as well if you need any guidance. Um, Without any further ado, I want, to persist, I want to present to you the opening session of the forum, Women Leaders 2020. It is a conversation among several trailblazing women on why today, more than ever, in these unprecedented times, we need women as leaders. Allow me to welcome forum conversationists, Katrin Jakobsdottir, Pumsile Mampo Nkuka, Amanda Nguyen, and Helen Clark. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the Reykjavik Global Forum, co-hosted by the Government of Iceland and the Women Political Leaders Organization. And to offer words of welcome from Reykjavik, I would like to welcome the Prime Minister of Iceland to make her opening remarks. Thank you, Helen, and, and I am grateful and pleased that so many of you are with us here today in this online event in, Reykjavik, in the Reykjavik uh, Global Forum. And we will all be a part of this very important conversation about gender equality and women's leadership for the next couple of days. In these extraordinary times uh, due to the pandemic where we are witnessing actually a backlash in gender equality, I think women's solidarity has never been more important. So I'm looking forward to having this conversation and really uh, talking about the issues that really matter. And I'm also very pleased to share with you that this conversation uh, here in Iceland and at the digital platform that hosts us this year, it won't only be here because we will also be bringing Iceland to you since you can't be with us here in the real world. Uh, to over 20 cities around the world where our ambassadors are hosting women's leaders roundtables that will be a vital contribution to the Reykjavik manual that aims to outline actions so that we can build back better after this pandemic. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister. Well, to open the forum today, we're going to have a conversation. And it's a conversation among trailblazing women leaders on the crucial need for women's leadership in these incredibly difficult times in which we live. We know that 2020 was meant to be the big year of meetings around a celebration of a milestone in gender equality. And that celebration uh, was the big anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Program of Action from the UN World Conference for Women in Beijing in 1995. But of course, our lives changed. We went online and uh, so many of us now discuss these critical issues of our times as we are today with some in one place, some in another, but nonetheless dedicated to uh, the cause. What we know is that women have been disproportionately impacted in many ways by the pandemic. Uh, for their health, their safety, uh, their livelihoods. And yet we've seen so many of the decision makers around COVID-19, of course, being uh, predominantly uh, men. So our opening session is going to be emphasizing how important it is to have gender equality in decision making and in the recovery from the COVID uh, crisis. And we do need to mobilize as a community of women leaders to generate commitments and action in what remains an important year for gender equality. And let me make a very obvious point that many have made. Women leaders around the world, like the Prime Minister of Iceland, like the Prime Minister of New Zealand, my own country, like the Chancellor of Germany, have been seen to lead 
their countries with such distinction during these times. So that brings me to our three opening panelists. And uh, first will be Katrin Jakobsdottir, the Prime Minister of Iceland and the Chair of the Council of Women World Leaders. Also introducing Humzili Malambo Nkuka, United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, and Amanda Wynn, the CEO and founder of RISE, joining us from Washington, D.C. So, to get things underway, Prime Minister Catherine, thank you for hosting us uh, in this consequential year. Your government has been so determined that the Global Forum for Reykjavik should take place in this largely digital format. Many of us would have understood if you'd said, there's other things on my mind this year, but you said, I want it to go ahead. And is this decision really reaffirming the importance of engaging women leaders globally to address the consequences of the pandemic? And what is your main call to action to us today? Hmm. Well, thank you, Helen. And I think all of us have heard people saying now when we are faced with this crisis, this pandemic, we really do not have the time to talk about gender equality. At least this is something that I have heard. And my answer to that is it's always the right time to talk about gender equality, not least in the times of crisis, because it's so important that the decisions we make on how to get out of this crisis, how we are going to build uh, the economy after this crisis uh, will uh, embrace gender equality, that our responses will be uh, considered uh, through the glasses of gender equality. And I think also we are seeing, as you so correctly mentioned, that the pandemic hits men and women very differently. We see women carrying huge responsibilities, not least within the health system, among teachers and other frontliners, but we also see them being hit very hardly, taking on increased responsibilities at the home. And we see a surge in uh, domestic violence against women. So it, I think gender equality has really never been more important. Absolutely. And this is a year to push forward and also leveraging from this very high profile and positive role which the women leaders around our world have been playing. And thank you so much for the leadership you've given, which, which relates beyond Iceland uh, and resonates around uh, the world. Pumzili Malambo Nguka, can I bring you in now? Uh, because you, are, above all of us, know the significance of 1995, the Beijing Platform of Action, and how important it was in establishing a new high benchmark at that time for gender equality and for women's uh, rights. Pumzili, where do you still see the biggest gaps for us as women around the world and also the opportunity? And how can the women leaders really accelerate on the progress that we need? And how much have you seen change during this very symbolic year and year of crisis? Thank you, Helen. Thank you to women leaders uh, for leading from the front. Uh, this year, indeed, uh, is a big year. We refuse to say uh, it is not. We are making it work one way or the other, such as this gathering. It's an important uh, uh, gathering. In 1995, when the Beijing Platform for Action was adopted, was indeed a, a big year for women. Because in 1945, when the United Nations uh, was born, there were not many women, let alone women heads of states. Just women in leadership were far and few in between. So there was no woman talk uh, mm -hmm. when the charter was adopted. But when the Beijing Declaration was adopted in 1995, there were 12 women heads of states in the world. And in 2020, we have 22 women who are heads of state and heads of government. So as a measure to, to, to look at how much we've traveled, progress but slow and just inadequate. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's significant that we've been able to make uh, these changes. What 1995 in Beijing uh, provided us, as you say, Helen, was a benchmark 
that helps for nations to define for themselves what is gender equality. Uh, no nation can come with its own version of what is gender equality. You adapt to be a gender equal society if you meet these common goals. And I think that has helped us to raise the bar for everybody and to gauge progress when, when it happens. So we have made progress. It's not deep enough, but it's significant. Uh, it's not irreversible, but is progressing. And at this point in time, for women leaders in particular, I would really ask that we push forward on women's leadership. This was also one of the issues was, what, that was most frequently mentioned by the heads of state at the high-level summits marking Beijing 25. Gender-based violence, very high on the agenda of heads of state. And for us, and as we have seen in COVID, unpaid care work. We have to crack this once and for all. I think all of us in this generation, as long as we've been activists, we've been talking about unpaid care. I think now for the first time, I see that there's a grasp of why this is important, together with the family planning and sexual and reproductive rights and health. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pumzeli. And let me now bring in Amanda Wynn from Washington, D.C. Amanda, you've done so much on the issue of sexual and gender-based violence and how to overcome it. And in a, a recent interview, you highlighted the importance of bringing hope that we can achieve sustainable change and drive our personal missions around issues such as those each of us have expressed today. How has your advocacy for the rights of sexual assault survivors changed in the past months? And is there a possibility to cultivate hope even in this rather bleak current situation so that we ensure that the response efforts do take the wider injustices into account and create lasting and sustainable change? Over to you. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And to answer your question simply, of course, Hope to me is a renewable resource. I, I know that today many people might feel scared. You know, I, I know what it feels like to feel scared. After my rape, I felt despair. Um, so when I met a broken justice system, I rewrote the law passing the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights unanimously in the US Congress. I, I wrote it as a matter of survival. Um, you know, that's what I did with my fire, my pain, um, but the work isn't done. You know, the world is going through a moment of reckoning right now. The pandemic is unprecedented in many ways, but there's one way in which it's been tragically predictable. And just as we've seen in the wake of so many disasters, the spread of COVID-19 is being trailed by a surge of sexual violence. You know, my, my team has been fighting to make sexual violence a priority among world leaders in the form of a universal survivor bill of rights. And that's because at least 1.3 billion people are raped around the world, but there exists no international form of accountability. And grassroots virtual organizing is our bread and butter. So we were prepared when the global pandemic hit. But peace is not the absence of visible conflict. Access to justice is a necessary prerequisite to true peace. You know, survivors' lives are the invisible war zones that corrode human potential and hold back the promise of a just world. And we can hold a light up to the darkest corner of human experience and allow survivors to be seen, to be heard, to be believed, to be empowered. We're also seeing a surge of civil action right now, uh, massive protests. People are fueled by hope, hope of a better world. The people who have the solutions to the world's most pressing problems are the people who live that problem every day. And so I, you know, I, I urge leaders and anyone in power really to include those voices for the people who are impacted by your work at the drafting table with you, because one cannot be what they cannot see. And I just want to end with gratitude. You know, um, my, my mother fled Vietnam as a boat refugee, and today. I get to be sharing this space with leaders like you. This is the dream of my ancestors. Um, you know, the first time that I told my story to politicians, it it sucked. I'll just be honest. Um, I went home and I cried. And the next day, I got back up 
um, because I'm a pathological optimist, <laughs> but also because I had to, my civil rights were on the line. And I was in an Uber ride to the United States Senate. Um, and the driver was this kind of intimidating man. Um, and at the end of the ride, he asked me why I was going and I told him. And this once intimidating man just started crying. Um, uh, just tears well out of his eyes and he said, my daughter was also raped and she went through something very similar. And when he stopped the car, he said, thank you so much for fighting for my daughter. Can I shake your hand? Has anyone told you that they love you today? I love you. And I'll never forget that dad. The reason I'm saying this is because I think that story represents hope. It's a, it's a shared story, collective progress. And it, it proves to me that no one is powerless when we come together and no one is invisible when we demand to be seen. So thank you so much to everyone for, for seeing me today. Well, thank you, Amanda. And what you've just said tells us the power of the personal story, that the man in the cab, who didn't look like he'd have any sympathy at all, you melted his heart because you were speaking and advocating for his daughter. And that perhaps, perhaps prompts me to ask in the remaining minutes that we have, uh, to ask uh, both uh, Prime Minister Katrine and Pongzili, tell us of an inspiring story of women's action that you've seen during this pandemic. How have the women of Iceland rallied, uh, Katrine? And following that, Pongzili, what inspiring story have you seen of women's leadership during the pandemic? Because there are so many. So, Prime Minister, the women of your country. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, Amanda, for sharing your story, because that's really what this forum is about. It's about really sharing our stories and experience within ourselves uh, the power of women's solidarity. And I think uh, because Pumsila mentioned the, the women leaders of the world, that we can really think about how important women's leadership is in this pandemic. And if we talk about the Icelandic women during this pandemic, I feel that they have all really been showing immense leadership because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have seen women in, you know, working in the health sector around the world, keeping up the education uh, sector around the world, really carrying those responsibilities, but also taking on greater responsibilities in the unpaid care work. And I, one of the things that I think we can share is that we have here in Iceland, at least, talked a lot about how important uh, it is to care for each other. And there we have actually seen Icelandic women taking a leadership role, all of them, in really showing how important to care for each, how it, it, important it is to care for each other every day, not just when you're faced with pandemic, but really showing that solidarity as a community. And I think... Um, I think if we can learn anything from this, even though we're faced with this backlash when it comes to women's, for example, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, we're seeing this surge in, as I mentioned earlier, domestic violence, gender-based violence. We can also learn from this pandemic that it's very important when we make decisions to have both men and women at the table uh, to share their experiences and thinking about everybody in society when we're making decisions uh, because that's really what this pandemic is showing us that equality and gender equality is actually an asset not just when you're talking about equal access to healthcare, but also having uh, equality at the decision making table so i think this is something that we can learn from a very difficult time and you remind us, Prime Minister, of the vital role of women in the health service and the mm. women have been on the front line of the crisis. I think 70% of the global health and care workforce is female. Uh, mm. So, Pumzili, can I bring you in to talk, to inspire us around the role of, of women in the pandemic? Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, my, my, my inspiring story is more or less uh, the same as the one of the Prime Minister, because uh, we have seen how what is called essential work is basically the work that women do. The 
the kind of like projection of women because they are health workers. They've been keeping people alive. Women are caregivers at home. They've been keeping those who need to be cared for. They provide food and in the, in the supermarkets, etc. These were the essential services that were working throughout the pandemic. And yet when you look at how much they are paid, uh, because under other circumstances, these are not regarded as, as, as uh, normal services. I mean, as essential services, but COVID said, hey, these are the real uh, uh, essential services. And of course, women health workers who sacrificed themselves were in the front line in large numbers. And one young woman stands out for me, a 19 year old in China, who was one of the first women to volunteer to go to Wuhan when we did not even know a lot about this disease. A 19 year old nurse, it was his first year as a nurse. She actually, when they were asked to volunteer, took her things and was say, count me in. And two thirds of those who volunteered in the first wave in Wuhan were women. What can I say about women? They are tackling a monster that nobody knew about. And they knew that as a result of that, they could also die. But their love for humanity and their willingness to put their, the lives of others uh, ahead and not think about themselves, that is absolutely amazing. Each of you have shared the most you know, amazing stories, the inspirational leadership of the Prime Minister, uh, Pumzili, you speak for the women of the world as the executive director of UN Women. And Amanda, your stories and your advocacy for those who have uh, been victims of sexual assault and gender-based violence and yet rise above it, as the name of your organisation says, to bring hope and inspiration to others. This is so critically important at a time like this in our world where, let's face it, it's been a bit bleak, but we've also seen the triumph of the human spirit. And I really hope uh, through the Reykjavik Global Forum again this year, we will have so many stories like the ones that the three of you have shared to inspire women everywhere to know that we can make a difference, we can uh, lead. So thank you, Government of Iceland. Thank you, women political leaders, for the incredible work done to mount the conference at this time. And I really hope everyone gets a lot from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.